Welcome. Thank you for choosing a Downstate Transplant Team for your transplant services. My name is Carolyn Rochon, and I uh, want to introduce today our team, which will uh, give you crucial information and education regarding your transplant journey and how we're gonna get you from uh, being referred to transplant to waitlisted and then transplanted. Um, our team is um, uh, full of uh, transplant professional who are dedicated to breaking barriers to transplantation and providing excellence in transplantation care. Um, and I hope you enjoy meeting them today in this presentation. Today, we're gonna discuss um, the different treatments of end-stage kidney disease or really kidney failure and what the alternatives are to transplantation. Um, and why might somebody need a transplant, really? Uh, we're gonna talk about what is a kidney transplant, what are the risks and benefits uh, of kidney transplantation, what are different types of kidney transplantation, uh, living and deceased, and who can be a living donor. We're gonna discuss what the blood groups are and what does uh, com being compatible with somebody mean. And we're also gonna introduce you to the idea that if somebody is not a match at downstate, it's not a problem. We're gonna discuss with you why the kidney transplantation evaluation is necessary. Um, and you are going to meet a multidisciplinary team and receive thorough education about transplant. And you're gonna know what to expect pre-transplant and post-transplant from our team and from, for your well-being. Um, we're going to discuss how you prepare for kidney transplantation. Um, and I want to ask you, as you prepare for your kidney transplantation journey, who knows your story? Who knows what you go through every day? Think about that. Make sure it's a lot of people. Um, and then we're going to discuss what one should do while they're on the list. Um, and finally, we're going to discuss something very important for your transplantation, uh, which is your support system and how you can uh, prepare uh, those who support you uh, uh, to uh, have the best experience and best outcome in transplantation. I'm the medical director of kidney transplantation, and I'm going to tell you what do the kidneys do. Kidneys remove wastes and toxins from the blood and put them into the urine. They also get rid of the fluid in your body and you can actually make urine even if the kidneys are not removing waste. They control electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, and chloride. And they also make hormones. These hormones keep your red blood cell count normal, which is why when you're on dialysis, you often need erythropoietin injections. They control your blood pressure, and they even keep your bones strong by activating vitamin D. Many of the other organs depend on the kidneys in order to work properly. Unfortunately, at this time, there's no cure for end-stage kidney disease. Instead, what we do is look for ways to replace the functions, all those functions of the kidneys. Kidney replacement therapies include hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and kidney transplantation. In the right person, kidney transplantation leads to an increase in your life expectancy, better function of your heart, and even better thinking ability. You can be healthier and have a better quality of life and even make your possibility of travel more easy. I'm a kidney transplant surgeon. I'm here to talk to you about types of kidney transplants. We have two main varieties, which are living donors and deceased donors. In living donors, we can have a related person donating a kidney to somebody, to their loved ones, and even unrelated people who are called altruistic donors who also donate kidneys. In deceased donor, also you could have directed donation where a family member who expired could willfully say there's a family member who has kidney disease could get their kidneys instead of going through the regular process. And then we have something called kidney donor profile index, which tells us the quality of these kidneys. The lower the number, the better the value of the kidney. And then we also have another variety, which is called donation after brain death and donation after cardiac death. Donation after brain death is when somebody had a, has a 
irreversible brain injury and there's no way for them to come back and they are organ donors, surgeon like me goes there and takes the organ out and gives it to somebody else. In donation or cardiac death, usually the brain's intact, but the pathology or the injury is so severe that their survival is very limited. So they're allowed, family withdraws care. Once the patient expires, you take these organs and then use it for the patients. PHS risk criteria donors are basically public health uh, risk criteria. Basically people who have uh, uh, promiscuous behavior or taken money or do IV drug abuse. So for this reason, we check these donors for these uh, uh, transmissible diseases like HIV, Hep B and Hep C and then um, we try to match the recipients appropriately. So what are the difference between living donors and disease donor transplant? Living donor transplants, a shorter, almost no wait time. You know, if you have a donor, you can schedule the surgery and then most likely the kidney has a very low warm ischemia time. That is from the kidney being moved from one person to other person. So they're more likely to work immediately and the chance of lasting much longer. If there's a living donor and uh, uh, he's not a match for you because of the antibodies, it's not a problem. You can go in for a, a, a paired donation where somebody else has a similar problem, but that donor is a match for you. We can match them together. National Kidney Foundation, uh, there's a process through which kidney can be matched to different recipients. And also, uh, um, you can donate kidney in advance and patients get a voucher and uh, you know, let's say you have a kidney now, you have a voucher, you can get a kidney and after this kidney, you can, you're eligible for another kidney transplant. Uh, in that way, you're help, helping other people along the way and there's more organs for this disease which usually has no other cure other than transplants. Hello, my name is Andrea Johnson and I am the Living Donor Coordinator for the program here at SUNY Downstate. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to talk to you about living donation and some of the benefits that are associated with it. In support of your transplant journey, I want to strongly encourage you to seriously consider living donation as your best treatment option because of the benefits that are um, associated with living donation. For example, um, recipients, they have a better quality of life because you remove a lot of the constraints that dialysis imposes on your day-to-day -day lifestyle. You have an increased lifespan, you know, it's proven that dialysis patients, once they're transplanted, their longevity actually increases. There's a shorter wait in time. There's no more waiting on the national wait donor list for a deceased donor transplant. You can essentially avoid or reduce time spent on dialysis. And again, it offers better success rates than, you know, in comparison to deceased donor transplants. And there's also an immediate impact as far as the kidney from a donor, a living donor, tends to work immediately and you kind of you avoid any delayed functioning from a deceased donor. Some of the donor benefits that, that are associated with living donation, this is the benefits that are for the living donor themselves, it provides a positive emotional experience because you are actually contributing to the quality of life for your loved one. You're giving them a better life experience. There's no medical costs associated with the donor evaluation or the donor surgery in terms of, you know, in, in terms of living donation. There's an improved loved one's life, loved one's life expectancy as well. So again, it offers benefits to both the recipient and the donor. You think about who can donate a kidney. Living donors can actually be anyone. It could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be a spouse, it could be, you know, anyone within your circle, your community. Anyone can step up to be a potential living donor. The donor does not have to be blood re related to you. You know, one of the concepts here that at Downstate that we tend to emphasize to our patients is not a match, not a problem. Again, 
you know, if you do have a potential living donor who is um, highly motivated that want to donate, but they're not a blood type matched to you, we participate in the national swap programs for patients who have incompatible donors. So again, that opens up another opportunity for more donors to come forward and actually help you out. It's important to, to know that donors must call of their own free will. We do not reach out to any donors. Donors have to make that initial contact with us first to show that they're highly motivated to do this, right? I'm making sure that we avoid or exclude any external pressures or coercions coming from the donor or the donor's external groups. Again, when it comes to cost for donation, it's covered by the recipient's insurance. So the, the donor's um, evaluation, the donor's surgery, the donor follow-up um, is actually taken care of by the recipient's insurance. The donor does not come out of pocket for any of this. So we, we make sure that the recipient has adequate insurance to actually cover these expenses. Many employees do reimburse for lost wages related to donation. So this is something that we strongly encourage you to explore with your employers. Some programs are available for additional reimbursement when it comes to travel expenses and lost wages, childcare dependent, dependency. So again, these programs are available and we will assist you in getting access to these programs. And then medical services related to donation are covered again by the recipient's insurance. So we don't expect our donors to come out of pocket for anything. A little bit about how it works when it comes to screening a potential donor. Our expert team will screen donors for potential diseases and risk. Living donors have to be in good general health in order to be considered a viable donor. And again, this process is determined by our thorough evaluation of all potential donors um, before they are cleared to be a donor. Um, an important factor to know when it comes to considering being a living donor is that it's also illegal um, and it's a federal crime to pay for a kidney in the United States. So we want you to stay away from you know, accepting any form of monetary gain or any form of value for the purposes of donation. So it could be money, it could be vacations, it could be paying off your mortgage, whatever it is that's associated with any type of um, value, monetary value for the purpose of giving a kidney, we, we don't encourage that and, and actually it's a crime. So we just want you to know, do this from a good place and coming from a good space and knowing that um, you're doing this to actually help someone that you love. When you come in for your evaluation, somebody from the team will ask you for the password for this presentation. The password is hashtag we care. I'm Ryan and I'm one of the transplant coordinators and we'll talk about what to expect during the evaluation. At your first appointment, you will meet with many members of our transplant team. Our team includes transplant surgeon, transplant nephrologist, transplant coordinator, social worker, financial coordinator, pharmacist, and nutritionist. You will complete a lot of testing to determine if you are a suitable transplant candidate. This may take several weeks or even months. A multidisciplinary selection committee will review all your testing to determine your eligibility for transplantation. You will receive a letter informing you of the decision. The transplant social worker's role is an integral part of the transplant team. We look at every patient from a holistic perspective. We look at the social, spiritual, medical history, the mental health history, substance abuse history, and also the social supports. We also look at the economic resources uh, and our patients' housing, and much more. The social worker is engaged with the patient at every phase of the transplant experience. There are four phases. The pre-listing phase, the wait-listing phase, the transplantation phase, and the post-transplant phase. 
The pre-listing phase is where the, the patient meets the social worker as well as the team for the very first time. This is where we evaluate the patient to determine whether they will be a candidate for the transplant. The waitlisting period is where we reevaluate the patient on an annual basis or we address any issues within that time that may need to be addressed. The transplantation phase is where the social worker will meet with the patient after the patient has received the transplant within the inpatient unit. This social worker usually assists the patient with any discharge needs, coordinate any kind of care that the patient needs post-discharge. The post-transplant phase, the social workers within the outpatient unit follows the patient at every uh, clinic appointment. And this is where we evaluate the patient to see whether or not anything has changed and whether the patient has new needs and how we can link that patient to um, community resources to help them to meet their needs. And so why are we important uh, in terms of engaging the patient and also intervention? We're there to build rapport with the patient and provide education not only to the patient, but also their caregivers. We're also there to determine the patient's readiness to have a transplant and partner with the team. We're also there to determine whether the caregivers are ready and willing to participate in the patient's care post-transplant. We engage the patients continually to eval evaluate their social dynamics throughout the transplant phase and post-transplant. Uh, the purpose of our evaluation is also to see whether or not there are any psychosocial risk factors that might be a barrier to the successful transplant outcome. And the key of our role also is to coordinate the patient's care. Surgery is scheduled in advance once your donor is approved for living donor transplant or done emergently once the deceased donor is available and offered to you. The surgery itself is going to take around three hours. We will not remove your native kidneys, those kidneys that you were born with. We're going to make an incision in the lower part of your ab abdomen where the new kidney is going to be placed. The blood vessels of the new kidney are attached to the blood vessels in the lower part of your abdomen. The new kidney ureter, which is the tube that connects the kidney to the bladder, is connected to your bladder, and we place a stent which is used to promote healing. That stent will be removed one month after the transplant. The new kidney may start making urine immediately, especially if it is done from a living donor. A urinary a catheter a Foley catheter, which is a tube that goes inside your bladder, will help drain the urine from the bladder immediately after the surgery, and uh, that will also promote healing of the connection between your new kidney and the bladder. Risks of kidney transplant surgery. You must be healthy enough to undergo surgery. Kidney transplant can only be done when your heart health is up to a certain minimum. Therefore, we will test your heart, your lungs, and your functional status. Some of the risks of uh, transplant surgery includes risks to your heart, infections, bleeding, which may require blood transfusions, development of blood clots, sometimes you may experience a stroke, and rarely, you may need to return to the operating room in order to treat some of these complications, such as bleeding or problems with the blood flow to the kidney. Some kidneys do not work immediately. In those cases, you may require a few sessions of dialysis after the transplant until the kidney quote-unquote wakes up. A small percentage of kidneys actually never work, but that is a very uncommon occurrence. 
I'll be talking to you about some complications that can occur after three months of kidney transplant. These are by consensus or convention called long or late term complications of kidney transplant. The first on my list is rejection. Rejection is when your body attacks your new kidney with the purpose of destroying it. We don't want this to happen, so we'll give you medication to prevent rejection, anti-rejection pills, and create harmony between your body and the kidney. You will be on anti-rejection medication as long as you have the kidney. Stopping the medication is not an option. You will lose your kidney if you stop the medication. Second is the risk of infection. Your immune system will become weaker as a result of the anti-rejection medication. You will therefore be placed on medications to help prevent some viral and bacterial infections. Vaccination before and after transplant is another important way to prevent some infection and is recommended for your protection. Third is the risk of worsening diabetes or developing diabetes after transplant. Some of your anti-rejection medications may raise or increase your blood sugar. A healthy diet, regular exercise, and weight reduction as needed is very important. Fourth is the risk of some cancers. Your immune system helps prevent some cancer. When it is weak, your risk or chance of having some cancer increases. The most common cancer in transplant patient is skin cancer. To reduce the risk, you will have to avoid excessive sun exposure and wear sunscreen. Because cancers have better response to treatment and greater chance of cure when detected early, you will need to follow up with your primary care provider to continue or start regular recommended routine cancer screening, in addition to yearly dermatology screening for skin cancer. Behavior that increases your risk of cancer should be avoided. Fifth is fertility. Fertility improves after kidney transplant in males or females transplant recipients compared with fertility on dialysis. Female recipient of childbearing age who do not want to become pregnant should discuss effective contraception with their providers. Female recipients of childbearing age should be aware that some transplant medications are dangerous during pregnancy. Therefore, pregnancy should be planned after transplant so that medications can be adjusted. Transplant recipients of either gender or sex should inform their providers of any planned pregnancy. Cyst is cardiovascular disease. Due to some transplant medications and nature of kidney disease, your risk of cardiac or heart disease is higher than general population after transplant, but lower than if you stayed on dialysis. Healthy diet, regular exercise, avoidance of obesity, and regular follow-up with your cardiologist if you have heart disease is very important. Thank you for your time and attention. Blood type compatibility is important for determining if a kidney donor matches the recipient. If you have A blood type, you could receive a kidney from someone with either A or O blood type. For B blood type, a compatible donor would have either A2, B, or O blood type. If you have AB blood type, you can receive a kidney from anyone. And for O blood type, you will need a donor with O blood type. Your waiting time largely depends on the blood type matching, how many years you've already spent on dialysis, or for those not yet on dialysis, the date of listing whichever comes first. I'm one of the kidney transplant coordinators. There's several distinctions between deceased donor kidneys. They are all ranked by an index score, also known as the kidney donor profile index. The lower the number, the longer the kidney is expected to last. A high index score are those that are greater than 85%. These tend to be from donors who are older, they died from a stroke, or they had a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, or elevated creatinine at the time of donation. These kidneys may not last quite as long as lower index score kidneys, but they will still get people off of dialysis for many years. Another distinction between deceased donor kidneys are those that are called donors by cardiac death. These are kidneys that come from donors where life support is withdrawn and death is defined when the heart stops. Often, these kidneys have downtime and they may not work right away. But when they do start working, they will work as long as any other kidney of the same index score. Donors with risk factors associated with disease transmission are kidneys that come from donors who meet the criteria for possible infectious disease transmission, for example, HIV, hepatitis B, or hepatitis C. All kidney donors 
that you will be matched to have tested negative for these infections. Therefore, the risk is very low. These are kidneys that come from donors who have a history of recent incarceration, high-risk sexual activities, IV drug use, blood product exposure, or sexual exposure with a person in the previous category. It's important that you consider all organ types. You should open all the doors to the kidney, any kidney offers for yourself. You can always say no to a kidney offer. You can always decline an organ offer, and there's no penalty to you. Saying so may shorten your wait time. All kidney transplantations have a higher survival rate compared to those who stay on dialysis. Some higher index kidneys may not last as long as lower index one, but please consider all organ types. Thank you. Today, I want to talk to you about multi-listing. Kidneys are offered to candidates listed at Transplant Hospital within a 250 miles of the donor hospital. So listing in different regions and at different centers allows a patient to be eligible to receive organ from a larger area that may have different criteria. This means each center has its own specific criteria for listing, so an inpatient evaluation may be needed. Medicare and private insurance allow for multiple listing. While you wait on the wait list, please inform us of any change in your health condition. If you have had any blood transfusion, make sure you follow up with any testing requested by the transplant center. Ensure that blood samples are sent to our tissue typing labs. This is also done by your dialysis center. Failure to do it, any of the above may result in a missed opportunity to receive an organ. While you're on the wait list, it's important to share your story and learn more about living donation and find yourself a living donor. The next topic is deceased donor kidney when an offer comes in. When an offer comes in for you, the patient, you will be notified via phone when an organ offer becomes available. This means we can call you at any time during the day or night. When an offer comes in for you, it is important that you're always reachable. When the offer comes in, the coordinator will discuss the offer. You will have the opportunity to ask questions. If you accept the organ, you will report to the hospital for admission and surgery preparation. Don't worry, the transplant coordinator will guide you through this process. Thank you. I am one of the physician assistants in the transplant unit. I will be taking care of you before and after the surgery. After the surgery, most of the kidneys we transplant work right away. Sometimes the kidney is in shock. You may need dialysis until the kidney wakes up. Your kidney function, your response to the medications, your vital signs are all checked frequently. You will be in the recovery room for about four hours before being transferred to the transplant unit. It is important to start doing deep breathing exercises, walking around to expedite recovery. The typical hospital stay is between three to five days and the urinary catheter will stay two to 10 days depending on the condition of your bladder. Transplant follow-up. You will go home three to five days on average after surgery. We will see you in clinic often after you are discharged, sometimes twice a week. Nurse practitioners, surgeons, nephrologists, dietitians, pharmacists, and social workers are all available for you. Our team wants to hear everything about you, how you feel, your anxieties, your mental issues, your struggles with the medications, your financial stressors, and your sexual health issues. Recovery from transplant is hard because it is life-changing. We will do it with you. Our team will follow you as long as you keep your kidney. In this section, we will be discussing what to expect in regards to medication after your transplant. After transplant, you will be started on at least seven new medications. These can easily add up to 20 or more pills a day. 
They include anti-rejection medications, anti-infection medications, medications to help with side effects, as well as maintenance medications, all of which we will go into more detail over the next few slides. However, the most important thing to know is that you can never miss a dose of these medications or stop taking them on your own unless specifically instructed by your transplant team. It is important that you do not change any of your medications on your own because doing so may hurt your kidney. The good news is over time, the number of medications will go down. You may be asking yourself, why do I need to be on so many medications? The reason is when you are given a transplant, your body knows that this new kidney is not your original kidney. Your body is going to think that it is a foreign object. It is going to send attack cells to attack your new kidney. Over time, the kidney gets so damaged that it can no longer be functional and you end up losing that new kidney. So some of these medications suppress your body's immune system to prevent your body from attacking your new kidney. Because your body's immune system is suppressed, you are also at a higher risk of infections. So some of these other medications also help you to prevent infections. Some commonly used medications, as we discussed, are going to be immunosuppression medications or anti-rejection medications. These block your body's immune system to prevent the body from attacking the kidney. You will have to be on these for a very long time. Other medications are to prevent infection or anti-infection medications that help to prevent bacterial, viral, or fungal infections. You are usually going to be on these for a few months up to one year. Other medica medications include those to prevent side effects or medications to prevent other disease states such as blood pressure or diabetes, some of which you may have been on before the transplant. We will give you detailed instructions about what medications you will need to take. This chart contains a lot of information about the purpose of the medication, the name of the medications, how often you have to take them, how long you, you will have to be on the medications, as well as possible side effects. You may review this chart at your own time later. In regards to side effects, the team will be working very closely with you to monitor for these side effects. If you have side effects that are not tolerable, the transplant doctors will work with you to adjust the dosage or to change you to another medication that may be more tolerable. Again, the most important information to know is that you will need to take these transplant medications for the rest of the kidney's life. If you are currently struggling with taking medications, please let us know. We can help you with planning or coming up with strategies to make taking medications easier. If you are against taking multiple medications, the transplant may not be for you. After transplant, please also remember not to take any uh, herbal supplements, vitamins, over-the-counter products, as well as medications that are not prescribed to you by the transplant team because these may hurt your kidney. We look forward to working with you in keeping your new kidney happy and healthy. Transplant caregivers, someone who provide services after or before the surgery, okay? Taking care of your health is very important. You cannot help, you cannot help someone if you are not in the right place. Okay? A transplant caregiver is someone who provides direct support of care to someone who has received transplant. This support will be medical, financial, and emotional. A caregiver could be uh, your spouse, your children, your friends, or even a coworker. Thank you very much. I hope your experience at SUNY Don State is a great one. Every transplant center's outcome is uh, public data. And a patient who is considering getting listed or transplanted to the center can access all the different centers they wish to see on a national website. 
this website is called SRTR, Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. You have uh, below the website address that you, where you can go. Our center's code is NYDS. And on this um, website, you can find out everything about outcomes at SUNY Downstate for patients who get listed with us. I hope that this education was useful to you. Um, and uh, I just want to wrap up all the information uh, you've gained today. Um, you will hear a lot of information uh, as you meet with our team on your first evaluation day, and this can be overwhelming. Participate. Let us know if you're overwhelmed. It would be normal. Ask questions as often as you need to. Uh, we will give you a lot of reference material for you to look through. Go ahead and look through it and then either come back, email us, or call us if you have questions. Um, our uh, main number is 718-270-3168. Um, remember, we're all in this together and we're happy that you chose us for this important journey. Thank you. I just wanna remind you again that when you come in for your evaluation, a member of our team will ask you for the password. The password for this presentation is hashtag we care.